Thank you for pressing play. Your presence here brings joy to my heart. Thank you for joining us today as we dive into 2012 Guinea Bissau Sat. On 12 April 2012, a coup d'état in Guinea-Bissau was staged by elements of the armed forces about two weeks before the second round of a presidential election between Carlos Gomez Ginaya and Cumba Isle. The coup started in the evening with military personnel and equipment making its way onto the streets, followed by the state-owned media being taken off air. Both second-round candidates and the incumbent president were initially arrested by the hunter. Members of the military council, which ran the country until an interim national transitional council was established on 15 April, said that one of the reasons for the coup was the incumbent civilian administration's call for Angolan help to reform the military. Following international condemnation and sanctions against leaders of the junta, an agreement was signed that led to the third-place candidate in the election, Manuel Sofon Hamayo being selected as interim president. The presidential election was aborted and postponed for at least two years into the future. An interim government was tasked with administering Guinea-Bissau in the meantime. Without wasting any more time, let's jump into the fascinating world of background. The media and international think tanks have highlighted the country's instability and labelled it a narco-state. The country has frequently featured military involvement in civil administration since independence from Portugal in 1974. As such, the events leading up to the 2012 coup include military unrest in 2010 and a failed coup attempt in 2011. The latter followed in fighting between the country's navy and the army. Guinea-Bissau's instability is also exacerbated as a transit point for drug shipments from Latin America to Europe and there are allegations that government ministers and military personnel are bribed to keep silent. Following the death of President Willem Bakay San on 9 January 2012, a new election was scheduled to be held within 90 days in accordance with the constitution. Despite a peaceful campaign, there were external fears of possible violence or a coup sat if the army did not approve of the winner. In this regard, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon called for a peaceful, orderly and transparent election. Just before the attack, presidential candidate Kumba Isle, who claimed to have ties with members of his Balinta ethnic group, who are the largest ethnicity in the military, warned of consequences if there was campaigning for the second round of the election due to his allegations of fraud in the first round that were unanswered. The first round result was rejected by five of the nine candidates. Campaigning was due to start on 13 April for the second round until its disruption as a result of the coup sat. Days before the coup, Fellow Lusophone country Angola announced its forces would be ending the two-year-old Angolan military mission in Guinea-Bissau MISSANG that followed a similar failed effort by the European Union as part of the United Nations Integrated Peacebuilding Office in Guinea-Bissau UNIOGBIS. State-owned Angolan news agency ANGOP said that the Angolan troops were sent to Guinea-Bissau in March 2011 in accordance with a bilateral military agreement to reform the armed forces. On 16 April, Guinea-Bissau Defense Minister Jorge Tolentino Araya was scheduled to arrive in Angola to meet his counterpart Guido Pereira dos Santos Vandinam and the Army Chief of Staff Geraldo Sacupengo Nunda. He was also expected to visit the Higher Warfare School ESG and the Higher Technical Military Institute ISTM. The same day as the coup, the two Lusophone countries of Angola and Cape Verde agreed to review their defence cooperation agreements. Presidential candidate and former Prime Minister Carlos Gomez Ginaya was also unpopular with the army for his attempts to reform the institution. Get ready to immerse yourself in the world of rationale as we examine its impact and relevance. According to Portugal's SIC Notchias, a day before the coup an unidentified military commander claimed Gomez Ginaya would allow Angolan troops into the country. He also claimed that soldiers possessed a secret document that allowed the Guinea-Bissau government to sanction an Angolan attack on Guinea-Bissau's military. 
the leaders of the hunter released an unsigned communique that read they did not have ambitions of power and that the coup was a reaction to the alleged agreement with Angola because the 200 military trainers would annihilate Guinea-Bissau's armed forces. The spokesman for the hunter that took over after the coup, Lieutenant Colonel Dorbana Nawana later said that Gomez Jinai and Pereira were ousted because of unease in the armed forces over the election, a sentiment echoed by diplomats. Gomez Jr. was also viewed as the candidate of Angola in the election, according to Chatham House's Africa director Alex Vines. He also said that the months leading up to the events featured media commentary and hostility towards Angola. Get ready for a thought-provoking discussion as we delve into coup d'etat and its impact on our understanding. On 12 April, gunfire was heard between 7 and 9, as mutinous troops attempted to overthrow the government by seizing control of the centre of the capital, Bissa. Initial reports by diplomats in the country said presidential candidate Carlos Gomez Ginaya and interim president Raymond Pereira were missing. The mutineers seized control of the offices of the incumbent African Party for the Independence of Guinea and Cape Verde PAIGC and radio stations. They also fought police officers loyal to the government, forcing them to retreat after coming under fire from MOOCs. The soldiers blocked the roads into and out of the capital city and the national radio and television was taken off air at 8. The perpetrators of the coup targeted Gomez Jinaya's residence which was attacked by grenades and surrounded by troops, as gunfire was heard nearby. Journalists were also prevented from approaching the scene. Camilo Lima da Costa, the son of the head of the National Election Commission Dishodo Lima da Costa, told RDP Africa, one of the radio stations still broadcasting, that the soldiers had looted his father's house but that both his parents were safe. Soldiers ransacked and looted other houses they raided as well. Soldiers also sealed off the embassies to prevent members of the government from fleeing and hiding with foreign diplomats. Several unnamed politicians were arrested during the night by the army. Peter Thompson, the head of the UK electoral observation mission in the country for the election, described the situation on the night of the coup as a very large presence of the military in the streets. It did seem quite coordinated last night in terms of how the roads were shut off today. The streets are very calm. The city is much quieter than it normally would be. People are staying home. I do know that the army has taken control of the state media and state television, and they haven't released anything official. There was speculation on Senegal's RFM radio by reporter Noah Mankley that Gomez Jinaya had been assassinated by the army during the night by soldiers from the same Balinta ethnic group as Isle Emble. An unnamed number of government ministers, as well as the director general of the judicial police Joe Biag, were in hiding. Interior Minister Fernando Gomez, who may have been in the custody of the mutinous soldiers, said he feared for his life. On 14 April, looser journalist Antonio A. Lee Silva told the outlet that he had been arrested for a short while, but was later released at the same time as singer Dulce Neves and many of Gomez Jr.'s bodyguards. Senegal closed its land border with Guinea-Bissau on 13 April. People began to venture out of their homes at dawn and there appeared to be little to no presence of soldiers on the streets and no messages over radio or television from either the government or the coup leaders. There was an unusual quiet in Bissa, although photographs showed a big hole in Gomez Jinaya's residence as a result of the attack. Soldiers were seen standing guard outside radio and television stations, including the state-run television office and the presidential offices in Bissa. An overnight curfew was imposed the following day with orders for the members of the civilian government to turn themselves over to the army. Private radio stations were also shut. On 14 April, some businesses started to reopen but they closed early in accordance with the curfew. In this chapter, we'll be shedding light on aftermath and national unity government and its role in shaping our understanding. The coup leaders formed the military command under the leadership of the Deputy Chief of Staff of the Armed Forces General Mamadou Tokuruma. The next day, they put forth conditions for a national unity government after having announced the ouster of Gomez Jinaya. 
Its goals were the removal of obstacles to reforming the security sector, fighting drug trafficking and consumption, overcoming a culture of impunity, and the continuation of enhancing the democratic process. Interim President Raymond O'Pereira and the Chief of Staff of the Armed Forces General Antonio Indue were under the control of the army, however there were rumours circulating that Indue could be hiding and that soldiers were going to every embassy looking for him. Inge's spokesman Dobinalna said that Pereira and Gomez Jinai were well and alive and added that the things, for the sake of the country, that power cannot fall into the streets and decided to have play its part in seeking solutions with the political class to resolve this crisis. The military command later announced that they were also holding Isle Emble. The detained officials were later released. The UN later reported that the head of the Supreme Court and the Election Commission were also in hiding, along with three unnamed cabinet ministers. Senior officers of the army also met the leaders of the political parties and called on them to form the transitional government, but added that the army would control the defence and interior ministries. The meeting was also attended by, in a way, who was later arrested, the Deputy Chief of Staff General Mamadou Torkuruma, the heads of the army, air force and navy, the army's spokesman Lieutenant Colonel Darbana Nawalna and four colonels. However, there was no one from the incumbent PAIGC. Consultations with 23 parliamentary and extra-parliamentary parties discussed issues such as a transitional government including an interim president and hip of the National Assembly, as well as a PAIGC-nominated prime minister other than the incumbent and the government of national unity inclusive of all parties, and the dissolution of the National Assembly with a government led by the National Transitional Council NTC under interim leadership. The five leading opposition candidates Mohamed Isle Emble, Manuel Serifan Hamayo, Amrik Rosa, Akiro Doi, and Vicente Fernandes announced at a joint news conference that the boycott of the second round of the election would be in the name of justice. Anna Regula of Union for Change, who also attended the meeting, said that the military chiefs suggested the idea of new presidential and legislative elections. The spokesman for the Coalition of Opposition Parties, Fernando Vaz, said that discussion continued for a third day and that the grouping had invited PAIGC to participate. After the meeting the coalition agreed upon a set of proposals to put forward to the military command for a transitional unity government. There were some small protests supporting Gomez Jinai in downtown Bissa, although, according to Peter Thompson, soldiers arrested several of the protesters and put roadblocks on the streets. PAIGC, commenting on the transitional government, said that it rejects any anti-constitutional or anti-democratic proposal of a solution to the crisis, while also calling for the release of those detained. Tensions mounted within PAIGC between factions supporting Gomez Jinaya and Nhamayo. On 15 April, a demonstration of about 30 people at the National Assembly, where talks on a transition government were ongoing, was dispersed by soldiers. The National Union of Workers of Guinea-Bissa, which has a membership of about 8,000 mostly civil servants, called for a general strike the next day. On 16 April, an agreement, which intentionally excluded PAIGC, was reached with 22 of the 35 opposition parties to set up a national transitional council. According to Vaz, the size, composition and mandate period would be determined the following day and then discussed with the military command. He also said that existing institutions would be dissolved and that two committees would run the country one would manage foreign affairs and the other would handle social affairs. The former committee was due to meet the Economic Community of West African States ECOWAS the following day. The transitional civilian government will rule up to two years before new elections will be held. National Assembly Speaker Manuel Serifan Hamio, who had previously rejected the office of interim president in April 2012, was again selected as interim president on 11 May 2012. Sorry Jill was the speaker of the NTC. Brace yourself for a deep dive into domestic as we explore its impact and relevance in our evolving narrative. 
at an ECOWAS summit in Ivory Coast convened to discuss the Malian crisis, Foreign Minister Mamadou Saoudil Pires, upon learning of the events unfolding in his country, called for international support as the situation is serious. The soldiers are occupying the streets. I spoke to the interim Prime Minister and she said she was under fire and added that the international community should have an energetic reaction to the coup. Pires also dismissed claims that Ndwe was arrested suggesting that he was, in fact, a part of it he was also involved in the 2010 military unrest before being appointed Chief of Staff. As we enter this new phase, let's navigate the complexities of supranational and discover its practical applications. During the early hours of the event, the Foreign Minister of Ivory Coast, the host country of ECOWAS Daniel Cablan Duncan said that the information indicates to us that there is a coup underway. ECOWAS formally and rigorously condemns such an attempted coup d'etat. He added that it's sad that after the example of Senegal, where the elections finished so well, that we have, after Mali, a new forceful intervention in Guinea-Bissau. What I can say at this moment is that our situation won't be accepted by ECOWAS. ECOWAS Commission President Kadrid Sir Awadrego issued a statement that read, The Commission firmly denounces this latest incursion by the military into politics and unreservedly condemns the irresponsible act which has once more demonstrated their penchant to maintain Guinea-Bissau as a failed state. ECOWAS later decided to send a contingent of military personnel in order to provide security. The delegation, which would also include civilians, would be led by Queen and President Alpha Cond. ECOWAS also said the election runoff should go ahead. ECOWAS constitutes a contact group, shared by Nigeria and comprising delegations from Benin, Cape Verde, Gambia, Guinea, Senegal and Togo, to coordinate its efforts at resolving the crisis. ECOWAS also had a standby force to fill a vacuum that could be left by the departing MISSANG force, as well as considering international criminal court recommendations. The United Nations Security Council, which included the former colonial mother country Portugal, unanimously condemned the coup with a resolution that stated the forcible seizure of power from the legitimate government of Guinea-Bissau by some elements of its armed forces firmly denounced this incursion by the military into politics. The president of the UNSC, US Ambassador Susan Rice, said the Secretariat urged the international community to address the cycle of violence and impunity in Guinea-Bissau and also called for the immediate restoration of civilian authority. Note with profound regret that these events are occurring just prior to the launch of the campaign for the second round of the presidential election. Secretary-General Ban Ki-moon said that he was extremely concerned about the arrests of the civilian leadership, while his spokesman Martin Neseki said that Ki-moon called for the mutineers to immediately and unconditionally release all detainees and ensure the safety and security of the general population. The UNSC unanimously voted to restore constitutional order in the country and approved Resolution 2048 with sanctions, including issuing travel bans on the diplomatic passports, on five members of the military junta on 18 May. The five members sanctioned were General Antonio Inoue, Major General Mamadou Tokuruma, Inspector General of the Armed Forces General Isvanomina, Chief of Staff of the Air Force Brigadier General Ibrahim Kamara and MC Spokesman Lieutenant Colonel Dorbana Nawarna. In December, the UNSC expressed concern over the transition process back towards civilian administration. The UN recommended steps to ensuring a way forward entailed mediation between national actors, targeted sanctions on the perpetrators, the deployment of training and protections forces in accordance with the ECOSOP roadmap or the recommendation of the incumbent Prime Minister and Foreign Minister for a Peacekeeping Force. The community of Portuguese language countries CPLP called an extraordinary meeting to take place in Lisbon on 14 April. The meeting was to be attended by the foreign ministers of the member countries, Angola's Georges Rebelo Chicote, 
Brazil's Antonio Patriota, Guinea Bissau's Mamadou Diolo Pires, Mozambique's Aldemiro Julio Marx Bonoy, and Portugal's Paulo Portas. The CPLP also condemned the coup and exhorted the UN, African Union, EU, and ECOWAS to work towards restoring the constitutional order of Guinea Bissau. They further called for a cessation of military actions that threatened the state or the legality of Guinea Bissau. At the CPLP meet in Lisbon, Pires had said that the persecution is continuing. The CPLP later issued a statement of condemnation and also called for a UN authorized military intervention, saying that it had taken the initiative of forming an interposition force in Guinea Bissau, with a mandate defined by the United Nations Security Council that would seek to maintain constitutional order, protect civilians, and the country's legitimate institutions. It added that it supported the Angolan presence in the country and the initiate would be carried out according to consultations with ECOWAS, the AU and the EU. Rifts developed between ECOWAS and CPLP over the resolution mechanisms. The former, supported by Nigeria, Senegal, d'Ivoire and Burkina Faso, advocated a year-long transitional process, while the later, supported by Portugal and Angola, advocated an immediate resumption of the election. The African Union Commission's chairperson Jean Ping said that he condemned the outrageous acts which undermined the efforts to stabilize the situation in Guinea-Bissau and tarnish the image of the country and Africa. In mid-May, Guinea-Bissau was suspended from the AU. A spokesman for the European Union's High Representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy Catherine Ashen said that the EU has already suspended most of its aid to Guinea-Bissau and called on the military command to release the detained leaders and restore the legitimate government. Ekweledin Isomou, the Secretary-General of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, called the Kuahenis an unacceptable act adding that it would hinder security and the democratic process as it had occurred weeks before the runoff. He also called for the detained politicians to be released. Meanwhile, on 24 April the African Union Peace and Security Council ministerial meeting met at its headquarters in Addis Ababa to discuss matters pertaining to resolving the crisis in the country. In this section, we'll be peeling back the layers of states to reveal its true essence. Angolan Defense Minister Candido Pereira dos Santos Bandinam said that Angola will continue to provide full support excellent ties, adding that the withdrawal date for the troops was being discussed. On 1 October, the UN Ambassador Ismail Abreu Gaspar Martins said that it was seeking a solution to normalization of constitutional order through the work of the UNSC, AU, CPLP and ECOWAS. Angola's Lusa reported that Portugal, the former colonizer, issued advisories to its citizens to stay in their homes. It also rejected claims of an untoward attitude by Angola. A foreign ministry spokesman said that the Portuguese government is appealing for a halt to the violence and respect for the law. Portas later called for the detained civilian leadership to be released. Defence Minister José Pedro Oguia Branco said that the Portuguese military was ready to evacuate its citizens. It is our responsibility and our job to ensure adequate preparedness in the event that the evacuation be necessary. Portugal also issued a travel warning for its citizens. On 15 April, it was announced that two naval vessels and an aircraft were on their way to somewhere in West Africa ready for a possible evacuation of Portuguese citizens. On 1 October, Portugal's UN Ambassador José Filipe Moras Cabral echoed the statement of Angola at the same meeting. Fellow Luciferne countries Brazil and Timor-Leste also reacted to the events, with Brazil's Ministry of External Relations expressing their preoccupation with the events and saying that it would call for an extraordinary meeting of the UNSC to discuss the issue. Timor-Leste's President José Ramos Horta said that the situation in Guinea-Bissau, which I have followed over the years, is extraordinarily complex, dangerous, because it can degrade into more violence, and the country is not in a position to afford that new setback in the peace process and its democratization. He also offered to mediate the crisis. His offer was accepted on 16 April.
Green and Foreign Minister Edward Nyanki Loma called for restoration of peace and stability and of all democratic institutions when speaking at the general debate of the 67th session of the United Nations General Assembly UNGA. Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf also criticized the unconstitutional unraveling of democratic governments at the UNGA. Namibian President Hifikoni Poemba said at the UNGA general debate that he denounced the unconstitutional changes and praised ECOWAS for its work in trying to resolve the issue. Nigeria also condemned the coup and President Goodluck Jonathan also told the UNGA general debate, Guinea Bissau is another flashpoint of instability in the sub-region in which Nigeria and ECOWAS are engaged. Indeed, the contact group headed by Nigeria was set up by the authority of heads of state and government of ECOWAS to help establish a transitional government with a view to returning that country to political and constitutional order. In furtherance of this objective, Nigeria provided the sum of 10 million US dollars to the interim government in Guinea-Bissau to assist in the stabilization of the country. Russia called for the restoration of the civilian government. Canada condemned the coup, while the United States White House Press Secretary Jay Carney said, We call for the release of all government leaders and urge all parties to reconcile their differences through the democratic process. The United States Embassy issued a statement that read, It is regrettable that elements of the Bissaguinan military have chosen to derail the democratic process in Guinea-Bissau. At a day press briefing, the State Department spokesman Mark Toner called on all sides of the conflict to put down their weapons, release government leaders immediately and restore legitimate civilian leadership, adding that it appeared the hunt had taken control of media outlets, as they were off-air and the headquarters of PAIGC and were trying to restrict movement and that we regret that they have chosen to disrupt the democratic process, which already was challenged by the opposition's call to boycott the second round of elections. The State Department also issued a travel warning to the country and called on its citizens already in the country to shelter in place and avoid the downtown area of Bissa. In this part of the video, we'll be diving deep into subsequent non-political events and unraveling its profound impact. On 9 June, the last police and armed forces personnel of the MISSANG mission left the country. In late August, the Commissioner for Natural Resources, Environment and Rural Development Ibrahim Adim announced the union had approved a loan of 15 billion CFA francs to the country for security system reforms. However, the spokesman of the transitional government, Fernando Vaz, also announced that an agreement with Angola Bauxite to build a deepwater port so as to export Bauxite would need to be renegotiated as the agreement signed in 2007 by the government of Carlos Gomez Jr. is not fair. As a result, the terms of the agreement must be reviewed. The transitional government will not accept that Bissa receives 10% while Angola Bauxite takes 90%. The project, which had been inaugurated in July 2011, had previously stalled prior to the coup as a result of concern over political instability and an environmental impact study that had not yet been published despite passing the deadline. If completed the port at Buba would have a capacity to host three 70-ton vessels at any given time, while the project as a whole would also lead to the creation of a 3 million ton a year mine in Bow. By the end of the year the New York Times reported an increase in drug trafficking in the country and thus calling the events cocaine coup. It also cited a U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration employee as saying the country is probably the worst narco state that's out there on the continent. A major problem. People at the highest levels of the military are involved in the facilitation. In other African countries government officials are part of the problem. In Guinea-Bissau, it is the government itself that is the problem. A sentiment echoed by regional UN staff. The head of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime for West and Central Africa Pierre Lapaku also said, there has clearly been an increase in Guinea-Bissau in the last several months. We are seeing more and more drugs regularly arriving in this country, while the U.S. ambassador to the country Joaquin Gonzalez Duque added, as a country it is controlled by those who formed the Kudstat. 
They can do what they want to do. Now they have free reign. Brace yourself for an in-depth analysis as we navigate through continued political instability and its far-reaching implications. On 21 October, soldiers again attacked an army barracks in what the New York Times said was a coup attempt against the interim government. It also cited the arrest of an unnamed dissident army captain on 27 October as the organiser of the counter-coup attempt and reported that two other unnamed government critics were assaulted and left outside Bissa. Army Chief of Staff General Antonio Inwe laughed off questions that he was the power behind the throne and responded to the criticism in saying, People say I'm a drug trafficker. Anybody who has the proof, present it. We ask the international community to give us the means to fight drugs. Gonzalez Duque then responded, I can't believe that the one who controls the drug trafficking is going to fight the drug trafficking. The U.S. State Department's Foreign Service Officer for Guinea-Bissau Russell Hanks, who is not present in the country following the U.S. shutting its embassy during the Bissau-Guinan Civil War in 1998, said, You will only have an impact on this transition by engagement, not by isolation. These are the people who came in to pick up the pieces after the coup. His staff pointed to photographs of newly created stretches of road in a remote rural area near the Senegal border that had space for small planes to land and they suggested was under the supervision of the armed forces. Chief of Guinea Bissau's Judicial Police Joe Bieg reported on a dubious aircraft landing months before the coup near Inje's farm. He also added that the traffickers know can't do much. The agents we have in the field want to give up because they have nothing to eat. Guinea-Bissau's former prosecutor general added, A country that's not capable of discussing its own problems, it's not a country, it's not a state. The leader of the coup attempt was Pants Nchima, a commando who was the ex-bodyguard of Guinea-Bissau's former army chief of staff. Fernando Vaz said of him, He is a man with political ambitions living in Portugal. He appeared here in order to carry out this attempted coup. He flew to Gambia, and then he went to Angola to pick up arms. He has fled into the bush, but we are confident that we will catch him. With the foundation laid, let's embark on a journey into resolution process. In response to the UNSC Resolution for the Restoration of Civilian and Constitutional Rule, Secretary-General Ban Ki-moon appointed Timor-Leste Jose Ramos Horta as his special representative to the country on 31 January 2013, replacing Rwanda's Joseph Mutaboba. Remember to follow me on social media for behind-the-scenes content and updates.